to epilepsy, to uh, movement disorders, even occasionally neurophysiology. So one second, yeah. So we'll talk about what it is. Is it becoming more common? What's the pathophysiology for individual ones? How does it present clinically and how do you treat it? So again, encephalitis, inflammation, you guys all understand that, and it's autoimmune, so clearly the immune system activation, which is typically against extracellular proteins in the CNS. So again, we're not talking about other causes of encephalitis. Now, what's interesting is rarely you can get an autoimmune encephalitis that can occur after another type of encephalitis. So rarely you can actually get an autoimmune encephalitis after an infectious encephalitis. So the classic example is HSV encephalitis can be followed within days or even weeks by what's called LGI-1 encephalitis. So the question is, is, is this some kind of trigger from the infection triggers the development of autoimmunity. So is it molecular mimicry? Is it something else? So just something to keep in mind when you're trying to think of the pathology of that autoimmune encephalitis. So again, why is it important for a neurologist to know about AE? The, the main reason is it's treatable, right? And we know that the earlier the treatments, the better people do clinically. If you treat them appropriately and early, they recover better and they have fewer relapses. If you don't do that, then the outcomes are worse. Uh, now, when we talk about treatment, not everybody responds to first line therapy. Some people need second line therapy and some people even need third line therapy. And again, if you stop treatment too soon, people uh, do worse. So you need to treat them early, you need to treat them well if you're gonna get any kind of benefits. And again, you know, this is a serious disease, right? The consequences can be devastating. Many of these patients are hospitalized because of the complications, which we'll get into. And you know, many of them end up in the ICU. And why are they ending up in the ICU? They're there for status epilepticus. They're there for autonomic dysfunction. They may need intubation, either because they don't have ventilatory control from the brainstem or just airway protection because they're encephalopathic. So these patients are frequently very sick and don't always do so well. And again, what else do we need to talk about with AE? Many types are perineoplastic. So you don't just treat the underlying uh, autoimmune encephalitis, you actually have to treat the underlying neoplasm. It seems to be increasing. Now, whether that's because we're diagnosing it better or it truly is becoming more prevalent is a good question. And this is true for both pediatric and adults. So this is a disease that both pediatric neurologists and adult neurologists have to understand. Some of the autoimmune encephalitides that we'll discuss are more found in kids like or young people like NMDA. Uh, some like LGA-1 encephalitis are very typically found in older patients. So whatever kind of neurology you're gonna be, you're going to see it. Uh, also, this is a new phenomenon. When I was a medical student, none of these existed. I know I'm 100 years old, but when I graduated in 2000 from medical school, none of these existed. Even as a resident, they were just beginning to describe some of these. And some of these have been described just in the last few years. One of them we'll, we'll discuss at the end was very recently uh, discovered. So we've already discussed prognosis. You know, if you have very poor uh, mental status, if you're in the ICU, you know, if you're not getting immunotherapy, you do very poorly. In another series, though, surprisingly, older patients, sex, even status epilepticus didn't necessarily predict you were going to do poorly. And the mortality based on how you're treated and where you're treated can, can be as high as 40 percent, assuming you, you're really not treated properly. So this is an important slide because this is one way of thinking about autoimmune encephalitis, right? So, you know, you can think about autoimmune encephalitis many ways clinically, right? How does it present? Is it CNS? Is it PNS? Is it both? But this one's very good because it looks at the antigen that's targeted by that specific autoantibody. So are the cell surface antigens over here? Are these neurotransmitter receptors? Are these transmembrane proteins or are they even secreted proteins that are not bound to the membrane? So this is one way to think about it. You know, you have these antibodies. Are they binding to receptors? Are they binding to transmembrane proteins? Are they binding to secreted proteins?
And again, some of these may sound familiar. We're going to discuss not all of these, but some of these. Uh, this is another way of thinking about it. You know, what part of the brain is damaged? Is it the hippocampal neurons like NMDA and LGI-1 and even Casper? And again, not shockingly, these patients will have problems with memory formation, right? NMDA encephalitis classically is characterized by very severe uh, prospective amnesia, right? So not unusual to see that in NMDA and even LGI-1 as well, very severe amnesia. On the other hand, for diseases like GABA, AMPA, even GAD, there's problems with the inhibitory interneurons, so they have a lot of epilepsy, Olympic encephalitis, status epilepticus, et cetera. And then GAD and glycine also work on inhibitory interneurons, especially glycine, and that's more in the spinal cord and the brainstem. So these patients present with stiff person syndrome because you're affecting inhibition. So you're having too much transmission of electrical impulses across the neurons because you're preventing inhibition. So these patients will overactivate their muscles, they'll have muscle spasms, they'll have stiff person syndrome, they'll have tetanus. So based on the, the damage, where the damage is occurring, that sometimes will uh, cause the clinical manifestation. And again, you could see on the right side, it talks about prognosis, you know, uh, for NMDA, you got to remove the tumor. You know, for LGI-1, it's monophasic. Uh, so, you know, frequently they don't, necessarily get worse and worse and worse. Uh, and then we sort of talk about, you know, which responds better to early immunotherapy or not, right? For example, GAD does not respond particularly well to immunotherapy, gly glycine does. So this is a patient I'm going to present who was actually here at Downstate about six years ago. So none of you guys were involved in the care, so I can't blame anybody here. So this is a 24-year-old woman no prior history, came in, two complex partial seizures, some left tonic activity in the arm, brief loss of consciousness, had an awakened to sleep EG, which was normal. They consulted neurology, admitted to neurology, sent home a day later, was diagnosed with epilepsy. Uh, and then she was started, I think, on an anti-epileptic. I can't remember which one. And then two days later, she comes back because at this point, she's been acting bizarrely. She's wandering around her apartment aimlessly. She became hyper-spiritual, asking for God's help, and wants her mother to, quote, prolong her life. Same day, in the ER, mildly febrile. They thought maybe an infectious encephalitis because of her fever. Uh, they tried a lumbar puncture. She, she had a, a big, uh, a, a high BMI, was given a dose of antibiotics. Neurology consult literally said, this is a post-ictal psychosis. So treat with Keppra. And again, why use Keppra on a post-ictal psychosis is beyond me, but whatever. So treat with an anti-epileptic, but this is not an encephalitis. And literally this is copied from the neurology residence notes. I, I luckily was not the attending on, on service at the time or maybe I should have been. So day four, patient's gonna go home. Her mother finds her walking around her hospital room, stark naked, telling her that she's having a spiritual awakening. And she tells one of the neurology residents, I want you to have my babies, right? Day five, psychiatry is consulted. Uh, and uh, she has either an infectious or an autoimmune encephalitis, unlikely to be a primary psychosis due to her sex and her previously normal behavior until a few days before. MRI of the brain is unremarkable. Another lumbar puncture is tried, unsuccessful. They finally do it under fluoro, day eight, and they find that she's got uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis, normal protein, normal glucose. They do an abdominal and pelvic CT, and then they see small areas of fat attenuation in the right ovary could be consistent with a small ovarian teratoma. And sorry for the typo here, then there's surgery. So anybody want to guess what kind of encephalitis this woman has? Anybody want to venture a guess? It's an MDA encephalitis. Right. So, and, and why do you say an MDA encephalitis? You're 100% correct. Well, the, I mean, you put teratoma in the question stem. So that's usually the giveaway. Okay. So she has the ovarian teratoma, but what in the history is consistent with it? Um, her, her clinical history. I don't remember. It's like, oh, her, well, her age uh, fits the psychosis. Um, seizure. 
and she have a seizure? Exactly. She had seizures. She has this new onset psychosis. She's got behavioral changes, right? So I, I know I didn't tell you everything, right? Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, uh, I could have said, uh, you know, she, she had problems with sleeping. I could have said she had abnormal movements. I could have said uh, she's even having trouble breathing in worst case scenario. But when a young woman has acute onset of behavioral changes, disinhibition, uh, seizures, you always think of an NMD encephalitis. Can you see this in a young guy? Sure. Now, could this have been a primary psychosis like schizophrenia? Theoretically, but it shouldn't occur this quickly. And usually people with primary schizophrenia is the, you know, those of you who have done psych, usually there's some mood changes, behavioral changes before, you know, days to weeks or even months before. So it's very unusual to be normal and then bam, you have schizophrenia, right? But for NMD encephalitis, that's actually quite consistent with it. And then, yes, obviously, when you see it over in teratoma, that does tip you off. But of note in this case, her MRI is normal and her CSF is actually relatively normal. She does have 30 whites, so that's abnormal. Now, could this have been an infection? That's the trouble. Neurology kept saying maybe it's an infection, maybe whatever, you know, because she was febrile. Uh, again, it's possible, but could she, this be an HSV encephalitis? and that could cause seizures. But I would say the degree of behavioral changes, the hyper-religiosity, you know, you're thinking, and again, you can see this in an H HSV affects the temporal lobe. So it is possible, uh, but it just seems a little unlikely for that. You know, and unfortunately the treatment's different. So let's see if I can show this bizarre behavior for this patient from the video. Okay, let's see if this works. So she's had, this patient has a dystonia and she's got trunkal and neck extension, but mainly dystonia and some vocalization. Hopefully you guys can hear this. So you see the jaw opening dystonia? All right, you see how her neck is turned, right? She's extending her elbow. These are the vocalizations. So could this be a seizure? It's possible. You can obviously vocalize during seizures. Uh, would you get the dystonia that you're seeing? Probably not. So if you see somebody with these abnormal movements, vocalizations, probably not a seizure, if I had to guess. So now I'm going to show you a second video. So this is somebody who has opsoclonus myoclonus which can be seen in this condition, but it is seen more likely in other autoimmune encephalitides. So this is more opsoclonus myoclonus. See over here, you also see she's got probably a little bit of head sedation too. So usually opsoclonus are saccades that are back and forth. There's no rest between them, there's no delay. So you'd be looking over here. So a little bit over there, it's not the most classic one. Usually they go back and forth for opsoclonus myoclonus. So maybe a little bit there. <laughs> 
so I think she's trying to track now, it looks like. So it looks like it's going up and down. Okay, so that's Opsoclonus myoclonus. We didn't see the myoclonus. So, you know, as they said, as uh, I, I can't remember if it was Dylan, whoever said before, you know, this is clearly uh, NMDA encephalitis. And this was a book called Brain on Fire. Uh, it's a very good read. So uh, Susanna Cahalan was a reporter and she started behaving bizarrely. And a lot of people sort of blew it off. They said she was uh, under stress. She was uh, emotional. Uh, she was acting out. This is, a, this is a reporter for one of the New York you know, uh, newspapers. So this wasn't like a 10 year old. Uh, and they sort of blew it off. And then I can't remember if she actually had seizures. They admitted her to Lenox Hill. And then Dr. Najjar, who I don't think is related to Dima, uh, helped diagnose it. So this is the movie Brain on Fire. And I believe it was a resident had just read about Joseph Damo finding the, uh, the antibody, the NMDA uh, receptor antibody. They just discovered it. And then they tested her. And of course, she had it. They treated her. And basically what she does in the book is she tries to reconstruct her month of hospitalization. Because like I said, with NMDA, you get both you know, uh, retrospective and prospective amnesia. So she didn't remember any of her hospitalization. So this is all from the, uh, from the charts. The, the movie's a bit histrionic, as you can imagine. This is supposed to be an EEG, I believe. So again, in the majority of patients, there's a viral prodrome before the psychiatric manifestation. So again, very consistent with an autoimmune phenomenon, probably aberrant activation of the humoral immune system. Now, if you're activating the humoral immune system, how does that penetrate the blood-brain barrier, right? That shouldn't be an issue because if it's in the peripheral blood, how does it make it through to the you know, the, through the CNS, which is, which is the tricky part to explain. And again, who gets this? Mainly young women. Why is it young women? Probably because it's strongly paraneoplastic. It's strongly linked to ovarian teratomas. You know, again, we know teratomas have different tissues mixed in with them. So it's, that it's not crazy to think that you may make antibodies to all different kinds of tissues, including those in the CNS, by the way, because remember teratomas have a little mixture from all different parts, the ectoderm, the endoderm from all different, uh, you know, developmental layers from the embryo. So, but again, you could see this in pediatric, you could see this in adults, you could see this in men. So it doesn't just seen in young women and it doesn't have to be associated with an ovarian teratoma, but in a significant percentage, they do have ovarian teratomas and it is perineoplastic. And again, just to remind everybody that we've diagnosed at this point, I think five pediatric patients with NMDA encephalitis. So this is one example uh, from another institution of a toddler, behavioral changes, autistic features, got methylprednisolone, IVIG, plasma exchange, and then rituximab. If you can imagine, this was another 21 year old, 21 month old who had self mutilatory behavior that was getting worse and worse over weeks until she started having dystonia, gait impairment, dysphagia, and the like. And again, she's treated with dexamethasone, IVAG, and rituximab. So this could be an extremely severe phenomenon in a pediatric population. So what are these NMDA uh, antibodies that I've been talking about? So they target a subunit of the NMDA receptor in the brain. And again, we think that there's some cross-reactivity with NMDA receptors in the teratomas. You're making these antibodies against these receptors, but how are they making it from the peripheral blood into the CNS? So we think either this is disrupted blood-brain barrier, which is probably the likeliest explanation, or you're actually making these autoantibodies intrathecally which may be why certain uh, medications don't work well because they don't penetrate the CNS. That's probably unlikely to be honest. And again, what happens when NMDA antibodies bind to the NMDA receptors, how do they cause damage? So one is they reduce the density of NMDA receptors. Two is they antagonize the NMDA receptor. It's almost like using an NMDA receptor blocker like ketamine or PCP, or they recruit complements and then they literally lyse or just destroy neuronal cells. So they can cause damage in many different ways in the CNS when the antibodies bind to the receptors. How do they present? I've already mentioned rapidly progressive cognitive impairments. And again, it doesn't have to be psychosis. It could be depression. It could be anxiety, et cetera. Uh, seizures. Uh, abnormal movements, and they could sometimes come in catatonic. 
I've actually saw a case over in England where the person was literally catatonic, just not moving. We've already mentioned the memory deficits, which are very, very significant. Uh, they frequently can have sleep disturbances. They can either be hypersomnolent or have insomnia. Uh, they have severe autonomic dysfunction and they can die from that. And that's frequently why they end up in an ICU. And then finally, they can actually get central hypoventilation uh, and needs to be intubated. And if you don't treat them, the end result is coma, right? They don't just linger around and start getting better on their own. So how do you diagnose uh, an MDA? Unfortunately, you have to look at the CSF. There's just no two ways about it. The serum antibodies are not sensitive. You can have normal serum antibodies and you know, the test and still have the disease. An EEG might show seizures. A brain MRI might show changes in the temporal lobes, the hyperintensities on, on T2. There may even be enhancement, but they may not, like this patient who I presented initially. So, you know, you can't rely on the EEG or the MRI. You have to rely on the serology. And again, you can treat them till the cows come home. You can use IVIG, you can use steroids, you can use uh, rituximab, you can use plasma exchange. If it's perineoplastic, you have to remove the teratoma. If you don't, they're just going to keep churning out autoantibodies and no pharmacologic treatment will be successful. And again, it's tricky. You do, can, you, usually we do a pelvic MRI, but you can miss, especially a small teratoma. So then we're doing a transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll even prophylactically take out the ovaries if we don't see anything, because you could get microscopic teratomas that can present with the clinical features of autoimmune encephalitis months or even up to a year before you see a gross teratoma on imaging. So that's unfortunate, and that's a pretty big decision to make. Uh, so first line treatment is usually give pulse steroids and then you do a slow prednisone taper. If you taper too quickly, they can relapse. Uh, a lot of people do not respond to that. So some people will add on IVIG, not so much cyclophosphamide. And then, you know, third line is even using rituximab. Uh, I was telling some of you guys that uh, I uh, met a doctor from Seoul. And so what he does is he gives steroids, uh, I think IVIG, rituximab and an IL-6 inhibitor like tocolizumab all at once, which is a bit aggressive. So the other thing is you want to use the uh, APE score. So it gives you a sense of, you know, if these are positive, if you have a certain number over a certain number, it's very consistent with an autoimmune encephalitis. So for example, changes in mental status, autonomic changes, neuropsychiatric changes, you know, a prior malignancy or a recent prodromal illness, you know, uh, you know, or funny movements, dyskinesias or seizures or an abnormal CSF or an abnormal MRI, you know, they start adding up. And if you really have like over four or five points, it's strongly consistent with an autoimmune encephalitis. So these are features that you want to get on your history. Are there seizures? Are there abnormal movements? Uh, what's the CSF and the MRI? You know, any sleep disturbances, any neuropsychiatric issues, et cetera. That gives you a pretty good sense that there's an autoimmune encephalitis going on. So this is a second case of a 65-year-old man, memory loss, and he's having involuntary stereotypical movements. So let's see if you guys can see this. Yeah. Ah. Oh, here we go. Okay. Watch here. He's in a uh, EMU, if by the way. Watch over here, you see? And he keeps hitting the alarm. You guys see his neck, his lower face? A little over here. <laughs> 
Look over here. Okay. So why is it important that he's got facial brachial dystonic movements? What autoimmune encephalitis is associated with it? This is Johannes and Hazel. Our answer for this one is also LGI-1. Okay. Right. <laughs> you, can you can never go wrong, right? Yeah. So LGI-11111. Okay. So this is uh, almost pathognomonic. Uh, let me try the next. Oh, there we go. Let's try this guy. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to show this as well. Now, it's very subtle in this guy. You see? You see he's, his shoulder? It's very subtle. So the reason I showed you that one is because uh, you could, they're, they're not always so obvious. So sometimes it's very obvious, like the first patient. Sometimes it's really not that obvious. So these are not seizures. These are abnormal movements. They're called facial brachial dystonic seizures or movements, but they're really not seizures. They're really movements. You could be awake. You could be talking. You could be going about your everyday, and you just have these movements. You know, I had a guy, I think we counted something like 20 and 30 minutes. So almost every minute. Uh, they're usually very brief. They're usually unilateral. They always involve the arm and the lower face, rarely the leg. Uh, I don't know why they call them tonic seizures. And what happens is you start having these movements, and then usually within a few months, you start having cognitive decline. Now, the trouble is, is they're frequently seen in older people. So people just think he's getting older. He's getting older. So this is actually an IgG4 antibody. So for those of you guys who are into that, right, IgG4 we see in musk myasthenia, right? This is, that's an IgG4 autoantibody. This is the same kind of thing. It's a, a secreted protein as we discussed before. And it's found again in the temporal cortex and the hippocampus. So very frequently these patients have abnormal memory formation. Uh, and, you know, we think it causes involved in synaptic transmission. And what happens is when you disrupt this, you know, uh, for example, people who have a mutation in this protein actually develop an epilepsy. So it's not crazy to think that people with an autoimmune LJ1 autoantibody may also develop epilepsy or seizures, which they can. And then they also have memory problems because they have problems with synaptic transmission of neuronal excitability. So, uh, so it's found, again, uh, more in older people for reasons we don't understand, more men than women for reasons we don't understand, seems to be occurring more frequently. Uh, the vast majority have facial brachial dystonic movements. Uh, the vast majority have memory problems, problems with behavioral changes, problems with spatial orientation, getting lost, you know, et cetera. A lot of the times they have, again, like, uh, NMDA, they have autonomic dysfunction, insomnia, they can have REM sleep disorders. So sometimes they're mistaken for, you know, Parkinsonian patients uh, and they can have seizures in, in anywhere from 50 to 65%. Uh, and they could be, you know, uh, uh, focal that generalize, they can also be GTCs. And, you know, people can drop things because of the seizure or because of the facial brachiodesonic movements. And for these patients, you really need to treat aggressively soon. Usually the disease hits a peak within six months. Uh, and if you don't treat properly, uh, even if you treat properly, it can relapse in anywhere from a fifth to uh, almost a third. So how do you diagnose it? You could diagnose it either from the CSF or the serum. You can find these LJ1 antibodies. These used to be called voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies. You cannot use that test anymore. It has to be voltage-gated potassium channel, sorry, uh, LJ1 antibodies, because voltage-gated potassium channel are nonspecific. This is a type of voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, you want to use a cell-based assay, uh, which I think we now use at downstate. Uh, the CSF, the EEG, the MRI. So the CSF and EEG can be completely normal. The MRI may show hyperintensities in the temporal lobes, but you don't have to have that. If you have untreated disease, you can get atrophy of these regions. Uh, and then uh, uh, what's I, interestingly seen is a lot of these patients have hyponatremia. So if you have a patient, funny movements, funny behavior, 
hyponatremia, you should definitely think about this. Uh, in, also, interestingly, not a perineoplastic phenomenon. You should look for it, but almost never do you find uh, a tumor. So it seems to be idiopathic for that degree. Uh, and, you know, again, if you don't treat properly, you can do very poorly. So the goal is to treat with immunotherapy. And there was a recent paper, I think in neurology that looked at this. So you can give anti-epileptics, but the best way to stop the seizures in this condition is to treat the condition with immunotherapy. So again, we're talking about pulse steroids. You may switch them over to oral steroids and a steroid spring agent, but I would say people have gotten more and more aggressive. So I think we're really using IVIG and rituximab much, much more often. Uh, in the UK, they didn't, they didn't have access to rituximab, so they used a lot of Plex. Uh, but again, the longer you wait before effective therapy, the worse these patients do. A lot of them have permanent memory loss and permanent behavioral changes. And it's, you know, one of the most heartbreaking things I've seen in my career, you know, people who are married for 40 years, you know, and the wife tells me I don't recognize him anymore because his behavior has changed. He actually, some of them will tell their wives they don't love them anymore. So it's, it's really, you know, very tragic, unfortunately, you know, and, and clinically they look okay, right? They're not weak. They're not, you know, sensory loss. Their walking is not really affected. It's really all behavior change. Uh, now, if you start effective immunotherapy, I've seen this literally within hours, the facial brachial dysonic movements can, can disappear. But for the memory, for the behavior, that takes months to normalize if, if you recover it. Uh, and like I said, the behavioral issues, they have this terrible apathy. Uh, one guy you know, used to play guitar. He just didn't want to play it anymore, a patient I had. Uh, even after successful treatments. Uh, but you know, if you treat them properly, more than two thirds do return that they can perform their own ADLs. Uh, you know, prognosis, you know, if you don't respond to first line therapy, if you don't have a good clinical response, that's not a good sign of prognosis in general. And then, you know, there's LJ1, it's been looked at in England, in Germany, a lot of these databases, but they've seen earlier treatments better. And really, you know, Plex is better than no Plex, and it probably even works better than IVIG. Uh, and what's also interesting with these LJ1 encephalitis patients, when we looked at them, when, when I was doing a sabbatical there, is a lot of them had loss of taste and smell, which is very interesting with the whole COVID experience. Uh, a lot of them lost loss of hobbies and they had loss of uh, a change in their, their, their foods that they liked. So I had one person who hated chocolate. He began to like chocolate. I had another person who liked chocolate. He began to hate chocolates. And then the apathy, like I, like I've already mentioned. And again, it's very hard because a lot of people think you're getting older, you know, you change your behavior, right? You get grumpier or whatever. Uh, and in the UK it was very hard because people there really don't complain. You know, here in the U.S., you know, they'll, they'll complain nonstop. So let me, this is going to be the last case we're going to discuss. So this is a 55-year-old man who's had recurrent muscle spasms and tightness. Okay, and this is his EMG. So these are fasciculations. They pop in, and this is at rest. In other words, he's not trying to activate. So you should, it should be silence. And you see he's popping in, and they're irregular. OK? So this actually was a patient who had Casper encephalitis. So this is seen in almost all men, older men, very rare, and the majority of them have a limbic encephalitis and cognitive decline. Now, many of them have epilepsy. Many of them have peripheral nervous system issues. So they can have cramps. They can have fasciculations, which is why I showed you that EMG. And they, they will complain of cramps and fasciculations. Uh, they will have a polyneuropathy frequently. They may or may not have neuropath, uh, 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 autonomic dysfunction, uh, but they'll have pain, neuropathic pain. So you see these patients and you think, oh, it's a neuropathy, right? Except there's a lot of cramps, a lot of fasciculations, which you don't see f commonly in a neuropathy, really. If you think of all the neuropathies you've seen, uh, and obviously there's cognitive decline, which you don't see in a, in a uh, you know, in a neuropathy.
Uh, and then some of these patients can develop what's called Moravan syndrome. So Moravan syndrome is when you have hyperexcitability of your peripheral nervous system, you have CNS dysfunction, you can have terrible insomnia, terrible autonomic dysfunction, and they can have a neuromyotonia. And that this Moravan syndrome is seen in a minority of these Casper encephalitis patients. And this is something you can diagnose uh, serology, look at the antibodies, either in the serum or the CSF. Uh, the CSF is frequently very normal looking, like LJ1. Uh, the brain MRI is frequently normal looking. You get the theme today, right? The EG can be very nonspecific. So you really have to think of these autoantibodies. And just like LJ1, it's an IgG4 uh, antibody. And again, it targets this Casper, which is a transmembrane protein that's seen in both the CNS and the PNS, which makes sense why you have symptoms in both the CNS and the PNS. And this is essential for potassium channel clustering and synaptic network formation. So the thought is, if you affect normal potassium channel function, is that why you get the cramps and fasciculations in the muscle? And because it's also needed for synaptic network formation, if it interferes with that, that's why you get the CNS manifestations. People with Casper II mutations present actually with severe psychiatric issues. They can get neuropathies and they can also get epilepsy as well, okay? And for these patients, these are much more commonly perineoplastics associated with a thymoma. Some of these patients actually have the thymoma, both myasthenia gravis and Casper encephalitis. Again, if it's a thymoma, take out the thymoma, and then usually you'll treat with steroids, IVIG, or Plex, and the same as all the others. Earlier treatment, better outcomes, you can get relapses as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Okay, any questions? on these three encephalitides. So they're rare. Hey, Dr. Ancisco, just in general, for these patients, I know that we send off CSF studies uh, to usually make a diagnosis, but aren't you pretty much always gonna be treating empirically? I mean, in any cases, are you treating after the antibodies come back? Are you almost always gonna treat before? It, it, it tells you the prognosis, right? Uh, if it's NMDA, for example, you might be able to get away with long-term steroid use. But if it's something like uh, LGI-1, you may need a more aggressive uh, immunosuppression, like they may be on like chronic IVIG, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then, you know, the trouble is there are other mimickers, right? You know, is this an infectious encephalitis, right? Now that you probably will know if you send off a meningo encephalitis panel, it comes back negative. But, you know, can you necessarily differentiate uh, NMD encephalitis from, uh, or sorry, LGI-1 from Casper, maybe or maybe not. Uh, you know, could you have an, an MD encephalitis and a limbic encephalitis? And that you you need really, you know, the antibodies to make that diagnosis to differentiate between the two. So you may not be able to necessarily do that. What, mm. what worries me is, and this happened with another uh, NMDA patient, you're waiting for the antibodies to come back and it can take two weeks right? At least the downstate. And the thing is you wait two weeks staring at the ceiling, you know, so I would agree in that case, I probably would treat presumptively, you know, because you want to treat in the, uh, in the acute setting. But the question is, is if you think it's NMD encephalitis, you think you've seen ovarian teratoma, would you operate without the antibodies coming back? And right. we had a case here that uh, ob guyan refused to operate because they would not take it. And this is a 24 year old woman. I get it. You don't want to take out her ovaries, right? You know, unless you're really convinced it's an NMDA encephalitis, which of course it was, but then we lost that, whatever, two weeks while we were waiting. And you again, you could treat with IVIG plasma exchange, but it doesn't work well, which is exactly what happened for this woman. Right. So, you know, so the trouble is the turnaround time, but I think everybody agree you really want to make the appropriate diagnosis, uh, you know, because you get a better sense of, can you tailor your treatment, the prognosis, et cetera. You know, but yeah, I mean, the odds that a 65 year old is going to have NMD encephalitis are extremely low. That is true. Dr. Ancisco? Yeah. Um, what are the, what's the false positive rate uh, for NMDA, uh, if we happen to know that? And especially at Kings County, they have a first psychosis clinic and they kind of send those antibodies routinely by themselves, not as a part yeah. of the Mayo Clinic panel. So maybe the sensitivity specificity is is different for the one that they send. But 
So the old, the radio amino acid ones that were the old ones that Quest used to use had a lot of false negatives, not false positives, but a lot of false negatives. So they were missing it. So there's actually not a lot of false positives. And with the cell-based assay, we're talking about upper 90s, you know, percent wise for both sensitivity and specificity. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty accurate, I would say. Now, in terms of what the psychiatrists are doing, so maybe next week, I think I have to give you guys a lecture. I might finish this talk up. So there, there's there's actually a lot of controversy because certain psychiatrists are ordering it, as you said, for a first psychosis for a young patient. And the trouble is, is, you know, even if the false positivity rate is 2%, but if you're checking it in every schizophrenic who's walking in the door, you're going to get a few false positives. So what I would say is, you know, if you see other features, like on the APE2 score, you know, seizures, uh, 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 abnormal movements, you know, probably not a schizophrenic, abnormal sleep, unfortunately, you could see in schizophrenia. And then obviously the CSF and the MRI, you know, do you, do you check those again for these patients once the antibodies were sent? And, and that's a debate. Thank you. So uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, so lots of times we get like concepts from psych that they suspect it's an autoimmune uh, encephalitis when the only thing is psychosis. So what percentage of like new onset psychosis is actually autoimmune encephalitis? Like the, the, the trouble with that is it depends on it depends on uh, what study you're looking at. Hmm. Uh, it depends what study you're looking at. Like so, if you don't have any other abnormal movements or any other seizures, can I confidently say I don't think this is? I, I would say it's highly unlikely. I would say it's okay. highly unlikely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I would I would not think of that. Mm. Any other questions? Thank you. You're very welcome. I'll see you guys next week. I think we finished school.